Hey, welcome to Health Equity Mondays, hosted by Jasmine Leonard and Amari Richards. Here we'll talk about all things health equity, public health, and culture. Let's do our part to move health equity forward and all, all that, that jazz. jazz. Hey everyone, welcome to the February episode of Health Equity Mondays. You are joined by Omari and Jasmine, and today we're going to discuss pediatric care and health inequities, as well as electronic health records and health inequities. But before we get into any of that, you know, we got to check in. Happy Black History Month. How are you doing, Jasmine? I am doing well. My voice may not sound like it, but I am. Um, I am packing right now. So next time that we record this, I will be in Spain. Um, so I'm super excited for that. And yeah, I've really just been preparing for that and enjoying Black History Month because it's my favorite month. Um, well, that in March. So yeah. Well, that's awesome. Well, we, we wish you safe travels. Look forward to seeing the Spanish experience. I'd imagine that was pretty warm there right now. I don't know. I, I could be no, completely wrong. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's probably, it's probably, it probably is, what, same same uh, latitude as where you are yeah. right now? So right, it's so. like same temperature and everything. So oh, Wonderful. So not, not, much, yeah. not, much, not much change there. So you'd be good. <sighs> yeah different vibe or different cultures. So that's awesome. Oh, yeah. I've, never, I've never been to Spain. Def, definitely would love to go to Spain. Um, well, so, I have to go and tell you all about it. Please and thank you. Please and thank you. <laughs> and is, is there anything about Black History Month that kind of stands out to you? Or well, something that you wanted to raise up? I guess many things could stand out to you, considering that we have a Health Equity Monday podcast with. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, I would say it feels like it's been a quiet Black History Month. Um, I don't know, at least for me. I I did go see a couple of the like black movies that are in the theaters. Um, so I saw Origin, which was really great, and I saw American Fiction, um, which is also another great movie. So I think I was just celebrating being black in different ways. Um, so yeah, it was fun. Awesome. Well, that's cool. I, I have not seen either of those movies. Um, so, okay. yeah, but I'll, I'll definitely add them to my list of movies because I'm trying to be more intentional <laughs> in watching movies this year. So if, if you all have other movies and stuff over the last like five years that you'll recommend, <laughs> like, like <laughs> send, send, send them my way, send them my way to phmillennial at gmail.com. That's two ends, by the way, two ends in millennial. Um, but I, I also... Uh, I went to see a movie yesterday. I went to see the Bob Marley movie, which I enjoyed. Didn't really read up on like what perspective of it, like his story it would be, but it was very good. I think they really sit at a at an opportune time. Black History Month. They really focused it on the unity that he brought to Jamaica when they were having a lot of like gang warfare and division among the two political parties. So just kind of like framing it in that and. It's, it's interesting because I've been drafting and deleting a post that I've been wanting to post on LinkedIn just around like health equity because I've been thinking more about like health equity and systemic oppressions and many of the first occasions that I've heard those types of things and like the oppression of black people was through reggae music, was through Bob Marley and other reggae artists, artist music, especially considering that I, I'm like from Trinidad. So I think those kind of juxt juxtapositions just make it interesting on like what health equity is. And I feel like I'm going to try to talk more about that in the future. Uh, but yeah, I, I feel like for me, it was also a very cool month. Didn't really do too much. Had my head was down from our community, as some of you all might be in the community. If not, wait list is down below. Um, but yeah, other than that, I was just chugging along, chugging along. Okay. Sounds good. Awesome. So I, th I think you have the first topic today. I do. Pediatric care and health inequities. So there was a recent article published in the Lancet Child and Adolescent Health Journal that found pervasive health inequities experienced by children of color in the United States, particularly in pediatric care. Researchers reviewed studies published between January 1st, 2017 and July 31st, 2022, and found patterns of inequitable treatment across neonatology, primary care, emergency medicine, inpatient and critical care, surgery, developmental dis disabilities, 
mental health care, endocrinology, and palliative care. So basically, every type of care that children are receiving, they found inequitable treatment. To note, they only looked at children who had health insurance. So ultimately, they were they concluded that children from minoritized racial groups receive poor care relative to non-Hispanic white children. Is is that any any type of health insurance? <laughs> yeah, so they looked at private and um, public insurance. Okay, awesome. So they said that examples of poor care for children of color looked like being less likely to get diagnostic imaging, being more likely to experience complications during and after surgical procedures, waiting longer at times at the ER, and being less likely to get diagnosed and treated for a developmental disability. The strongest dis- disparity was found in pain management, where children of color are, were less likely to get pain medication for a broken arm or leg, appendicitis, and migraines. Researchers concluded that the causes of these inequities vary, but they are ultimately rooted in structural racism. And it's important to note that few studies included Asian American and Native American children or children classified as multi-ethnic or multiracial. So why are we talking about this? Um, I think it's pretty apparent, but this is one of the first articles to look at inequities specific to children in the U.S. Um, It's also important to remember that this only looks at the children who have insurance, so we can only hypothesize how disparate the care is for children without insurance. And if we take it back to, I think we talked about this last year, health disparities cost the U.S. economy $320 billion today. They're expected to reach a trillion dollars by 2040. Um, So if children are starting to live their lives experiencing inequities, imagine how the long-term impact of this is on the overall health and well-being as they age across the life course. And imagine how much of that $320 billion we're exacerbating by having children receive disparate care. Um, And so I think this is also pretty relative to some other studies that we saw last year come out about Black children and how they receive better care from Black pediatricians um, and other things that we've seen in the news about pay management care and how disparate that is for people of color when looking at the care for white people. So I think we've got a lot going on here. I care about the kids a lot. So this is why I was super interested in bringing it into our space. Um, And it's sad, it's frustrating, but it's good to now have some data behind what we thought was happening before. Wow. This is uh, very, very interesting that there are these disparities. And I think it just goes back to a lot of the themes and conversations that we had in season one, as, as you brought up those points, I'm excited to just dive deeper into these different topics and just understand and share where these disparities exist, because as we're coming to realize they show up in different ways throughout society and in different populations, but they persistently do exist. And I think it just goes back to our point of underlying that these are systems that are in place that are creating a lot of these outcomes and we need to ensure that we're working towards systems change. And I'll be talking about electronic health records and health inequities in a second, but before we get to that, just a little promo break. So I alluded to it earlier. Thank you all to all of you that join the community. I'm very excited to have the founding members onboarded and we're working through everything that's going to be in the community. It is going to reopen up probably during National Public Health Week in April. So be sure to join the wait list below. And otherwise, just join my email newsletter down below because I'm going to be sharing a lot more great information and insights there as well. What you got going on, Jasmine? Well, in honor of going to Spain and being off from work for an entire month, I'm bringing my newsletter back. (laughs) So I am going to recap how school has been, what I've been doing, and how I am stressing over thinking about a topic for my dissertation. Um, So look for that in March, and you can sign up for it below. Awesome. So be sure to check out those links. 
And now moving us on to electronic health records and health inequities. Electronic health records are essential to have better patient outcomes. They help provide the most accurate, up-to-date, and complete information about patients at the point of care. Electronic health records support quick access to information that provides more coordinated and efficient care. It allows the patient the ability to better engage with their own health records, giving them a rise in interaction and communication between the patient and the provider and it reduces costs via less paperwork, improved safety, and reduced duplicate testing. Electronic health records are an important part of the healthcare system. And before I go deeper, I just wanted to drop a lesson on the difference between electronic health records and electronic medical records, you know, just in case you get that in trivia someday, I think it's good information to know. So electronic medical records or EMRs are a single record of a medical care provided in a single medical institution. So intra record. So essentially it's just, if you have an appointment at a certain healthcare facility, they will have a record on you and it's whatever record is in that building, but that record is not shared anywhere else. And it's just at that one institution. While an electronic health record is a record of health related information on an individual that conforms to national recognized interoperability standards and can be created, managed, and consulted by all authorized clinicians and staff across more than one healthcare organization. So different from an electronic medical record, this is something that has been standardized and it can be shared, created, changed across entire health systems. And I guess essentially and ideally it would be across the entire US healthcare landscape. I really wanted to highlight three different issues around electronic health records today. And this, this, and this kind of stemmed from my research, just learning more about the first issue that we're going to talk a little bit about, and then how I learned about the other issues just kind of coming up from them. So the three issues that we're going to talk about, 7.1% of the U.S. population identifies as LGBTQ+, but this information is not collected in electronic health records. The second one being stigmatized language was seen in one in 40 hospital admissions. And the third being black and Hispanic individuals are offered and access patient portals at significantly lower rates than white individuals. So diving into the first topic, 7.1% of the U.S. population identifies as LGBTQ+, but this information is not collected by electronic health records. A 2020 study by the U.S. National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine titled Understanding the Well-Being of LGBTQI plus Populations concluded that the data on sexual orientation, gender identity, and intersex status are required to inform research, engage in population-level monitoring, and determine resource allocation and set policies that effectively address these inequities. The data we collect can support us in combating inequities and allowing for better patient outcomes. Sexual orientation and gender identity or SOGI, S-O-G-I data, which is a new term that I learned, new acronym, but I think is very telling. And I feel like a lot more data should be SOGI certified, if that's a thing. Um, so most clinicians do not discuss sexual orientation or gender identity with patients. Owing to a belief that this information lacks relevance to care, concern about causing patient discomfort or offense, and a lack of clinical expertise, knowledge, and language to have these conversations. So essentially, it's a training issue here. It's that the healthcare providers are not trained in inclusive languages in approaching these conversations. And I think the point around the belief that this information is not important, I feel like let's let the data tell us that. Let's not other a population by not collecting their data and then say, oh, this data rack lacks relevance. I think let's collect all the data we can and then use that data to identify where there are health inequities so that we can drive things forward. The second thing I wanted to talk about was the stigma stigmatized language that was seen in hospital admissions. So stigmatized language generally takes three forms, marking or labeling someone as an other, assigning responsibility that is blame, or invoking danger or peril. All three forms of these stigmatized language may appear in electronic health records. Some examples that are familiar to clinicians could be patients with substance use disorders labeled as substance abusers, patients described as non-compliant or poorly controlled, emphasizing patient responsibility for their illness and distressed patients being called belligerent or combative or implying purposeful efforts to endanger healthcare staff. 
A study of around 50,000 admissions found that 2.5% of all medical notes from electronic health record admissions included stigmatizing language. If you had diabetes, stigmatizing language was used at 6.9% of the time. If you were a person that suffered from substance misuse, then stigmatized language was used 3.4% of the time. And when looking at black patients versus white patients, there was a 0.67 percentage point in greater probability of containing stigmatized language with similar disparities in all specific subgroups for black populations. So essentially, the solution here, once again, is training clinicians to mis minimize stigmatizing language in electronic health records to really improve patient-clinician relationship and reduce the transmission of bias between clinicians. Because as I shared earlier, this information is not only solely at this one institution, but these notes are shared throughout the entire health system or whoever is, is, has agreed to share that information. So this just, if you have stigmatized language, it just increases the possibility that the this next healthcare provider is going to use that same stigmatized language, or at least coming with that implicit bias into that situation. And as we all know, we really need patients to be able to be listened to in all respects. And then the last one that I wanted to mention here is that Black and Hispanic individuals are offered and access patient portals at significantly lower rates than white individuals. When looking at the percentage of individuals who were offered and accessed a patient portal in 2019 through 2020 by white, Black, and Hispanic race ethnicities, 65% of white patients were offered the patient portal, while 54% of Black patients were offered the patient portal, and 49% of Hispanic patients were offered the patient portal. When looking at accessing the actual patient portal, 49% of white patients accessed the patient portal. 36% of Black patients access the patient portal, and 33% of Hispanic patients access the patient portal. When looking at the patients that accessed among those that were offered, 71% of the white population accessed it, 62% of the Black population accessed it, and 59% of the Hispanic population accessed it. So while we know how vital electronic health records can be for giving equitable care and bettering patient outcomes, there's much to be done to ensure that all people are accessing and using their patient portals. Some of the ways to, in, to increase the usage of patient portals would be to have universal access, to create easy access to applications or web versions of the, the portal, and also creating robust, engaged, and supportive training and resources on how to access and how to use the portal. And then I think there's the special mention in there for like maybe AI and especially around language translation which I think is going to be something that AI is going to really be able to help us in the public health healthcare space. So in conclusion, there's a lot of work to be done to allow for more equity in electronic health records stemming all the way from LGBTQ plus or queer populations and ensuring that we have SOGI data. And then there's a lot around the part of training and providing resources for healthcare providers to ensure that they are being as equitable as possible. And then there's a lot of work to do to engage patients in really taking charge of accessing their patient portal and using that to better drive advocacy for their own health outcomes. This is really interesting. Um, I think I look at this from the perspective of also knowing that there's like an issue with claims data mm. um, because... I work for an insurer, and so we have been looking for trying to get SOGI data and um, REL data into claims um, because we know that there's a difference in utilization, there's a difference in outcomes, there's just all these differences that exist. Um, and so I think that knowing that there's like also an issue within the EHR system is telling because even when we try to supplement claims data with data from the EHR, if it's not there, then we're still going to run into issues. Um, right. So lots of, lots of trainings, lots of things that are needed to really work on this. Right. And I think it, it is a lot of work upfront to ensure that the systems are in place, the trainings are in place, people know how to enter the data. And then from there, it is just like, maybe smaller touch, probably not that much smaller, but, but smaller touch points to ensure that people are using and utilizing the system correctly. But yeah, that is, that is very interesting to, to know that you're also experiencing the same 
uh, issues, challenges. Yep. Awesome. So now moving us on to the equity in action. And if this is your first time listening, equity in action is a true or false question that one of us asked the other during an episode and we tally up the score at the end of the year and we still haven't figured out what I'm supposed to do. I was going to say, we still do. haven't figured it out. But we, we, will, we, will, we will get on that because I forgot that was an action item. So until I just said it. Uh, so yes, we will figure that out. But Let's see if Jasmine can get this one today, y'all. All Uh... All right, let me see if I could succinctly try to see this. I'm going to give you a little bit of context as always before we get into the actual question. So sharing outpatient notes with patients may bring clinically important benefits, but notes may sometimes cause patients to feel judged or offended and thereby reduce trust. So that, is that, that the question? Nope, nope. Just lay in context. Oh. Lay in context. Lay in context there. Okay. <laughs> okay. So the question is true or false? 25% or more respondents reported feeling judged or offended by something they read in an outpatient note due to the perception that it contained errors, surprises, labeling, or evidence of disrespect? Uh, 25% or more? That feels like a lot. That's like one-fourth of the population saying that they felt judged. One-fourth of patients. (sighs) <sighs> um, <sighs> okay, I'm going to say true. Uh, it is false. <laughs> <laughs> it is false. Is it less? <laughs> yes. One, one in ten. One in ten. One in ten. One in felt, ten respondents. It felt too high. It felt too high, but... <laughs> Okay. You should have went with your gut feeling. One in four is really high, <laughs> especially for people that are going to actually respond to a CV or something like this. <laughs> I know, I know, right? But I thought if they were the ones that actually responded, then maybe they were the ones that actually felt that way. But right, right. So this and and this just to like caveat, this is like one study. So just to give the the factual information, <laughs> so it is. One in 10 respondents reported feeling judged, offended by something they read in an outpatient note due to the perception that it contained errors, surprises, labeling, or evidence of disrespect. So this was among 22,000 patient respondents who had read at least one note and answered two questions in this survey design that they did here. So there we have it. People aren't as disgruntled as we think they are. Yeah, um, and I guess that's good, right? But then the question is, how many people are actually reading their notes? So. That's true, and 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 I think it, it goes back to to the question of like, how much information do you want to have as opposed to like, how much information do you collect that's going to actually like be actionable for you as opposed to get you upset? And I I don't know, I'm 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 probably on the side of like sharing more and let get let people get upset and like yeah. fix it on the back on the back end uh, than anything. Yeah. So I think you're up too already this year. Just just putting in my time, you know, I've been shooting in the court, <laughs> shooting in the court. <laughs> All right, y'all. Well, it was a great episode. I guess next time you see us, Jasmine will be somewhere out in Spain. Uh, yes. Yes. So safe travels. Thank and you. And yeah, we will. I'll also be a year older. That is that is correct. <laughs> A year old and a year wiser. Yes, always. Love it. Love it. Well, thank you all so much for tuning in today. If you have not subscribed as yet, be sure to subscribe. Definitely helps get the show out to more people and helps people learn more about health equity. So please do that. Bye, everyone. Peace.